So I was going a little slowly this morning since it was the first lecture, so I'll speed up if you don't mind because there's a fair bit of material to get through and I have promised the subsequent lecturers that all the background will be covered in these. So basically what I want to explain in this lecture is when the publicity departments at CERN or Fermilab or Particle Data Group want to create a nice picture of how we trace back our history all the way to the Big Bang, and you have seen these kind of pictures, very impressive. How do they actually do it? How do they know all these numbers? Who has given these to them? They are all correct, by the way, okay? I'm not sure about the colors, but uh, <laughs> the numbers are correct, okay? So what we learn today is how to make this poster, right? Right, so first, this part I've already done this morning, so we ended by saying that the universe really has no large quantum numbers of any kind. There's only a little smattering of baryons and leptons, no electric charge that we can see, and the chemical potentials are all therefore very, very small. Okay. So now we are going to discuss the thermodynamics, therefore, of an ideal gas, and with a little excursion into field theory, not very much, because we want to keep things simple. So for an ideal gas, you know that the distribution function is as given by Fermi Dirac or Bose Einstein, depending on whether it's fermion or boson, uh, for a gas in equilibrium. So that, of course, begs the question what is equilibrium? And it will turn out that equilibrium is slightly subtle. There is chemical equilibrium and kinetic equilibrium, which are two distinct things. And we have to uh, be careful what you're talking about when you say something is in equilibrium. But for the moment, let us say that when we go to the early universe, the density is high enough and the rate of interactions, therefore, is high enough that particles can get into equilibrium. We'll quantify this later, right? But if we are in equilibrium, then, of course, we can just pick up your thermodynamics textbook and we can read off that the number density of particles will be the number of degrees of freedom. For example, for the photon, this will be two, left-handed and right-handed. There is no longitudinal state because it's massless, right? For a massive boson, like Z boson, it's, it's spin one, it's three states. And that is therefore the number of degrees of freedom. And then you integrate over the distribution function over phase space. And you get that for number, massless particles, this thing goes as T cubed, right? Just as, you know, for photons in particular, that coefficient there will be two zeta three by pi square, right? How do you know that? Because you can actually work out these integrals that I've written out there in terms of zeta functions. That integ general integral there is this quantity, and they're all given in terms of zeta functions. Similarly, for the energy density, you integrate the distribution function multiplied by the energy per particle integrated over phase space, and you get t to the 4, right? Some numerical factor. Always the number of degrees of freedom. And also pressure, uh, as I remarked yesterday, uh, sorry, this morning, pressure, of course, also gravitates. So you have to keep track of that. And that is the Q squared over 3E. That's the kinetic energy uh, times uh, the phase space, et cetera, integrated that gives you this. So this is for relativistic particles. You have non-relativistic particles. Then the distribution function goes from T cube to T cube times E to the T to the 3 half times E to the minus M over T. Okay, it's damped by a so-called Boltzmann factor. The number of particles in equilibrium is a very steeply dropping function of the temperature. It doesn't matter if you're boson or fermion. Now, this question of equilibrium now needs to be quantified. Kinetic equilibrium means the temperature of a particle is the same as the temperature of photons. So to keep life simple, let us say that the photons are always in equilibrium. In my next lecture, I'll quantify how we actually determine when the photons are in equilibrium, how a chemical potential can actually develop for photons. This is going back to a question that was asked this morning. But we are starting by saying photons are a Planck distribution as observed. There's no chemical potential. Anything that annihilates into photons, the chemical potentials are additively conserved. The basic criterion for equilibrium is that the scattering rate of the particle should exceed the Hubble rate. Why is that? Because the Hubble rate sets the time scale for any process, right? Within a Hubble time, if you like, the universe doubles its size. Uh, 
within a, uh, 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 the, the length, the inverse of this is like the size of the universe. So the mean free path should be shorter than the size of the universe. You can think of it as you prefer. But the basic criterion is that the scattering rate should be greater than the Hubble rate. The Hubble rate goes as square root of 8 pi 0 by 3. In the early universe, the curvature term is unimportant. Lambda is unimportant. So we just look at this. And rho is going as t to the 4 for a radiation-dominated plasma. So the Hubble rate is going as t square uh, times square root of 8 pi g, which we often write as uh, uh, m, the Planck mass. Planck mass is 10 to the 19 GeV, right? So basically, the Hubble rate goes as t square over mp, right? Times the number of degrees of freedom contributing to this rho. We'll come to that. Whereas the scattering rate goes as the number density times the cross section averaged over the velocity. Right? So that is the rule of thumb. In detail, of course, you have to solve a transport equation, but the thing is to get a feel for what kind of time scales and numbers are involved before we start uh, handling the you know, Boltzmann equation, which is in general quite complicated. So the decoupling will happen when these two rates are equal, and I'll give you an example shortly to make it clear that this is all very straightforward. So at this point, if the particle is relativistic, if its mass is less than this decoupling temperature, at that point, then it would also have been in chemical equilibrium because it would have been annihilating into particles which have no chemical potential. And its abundance will be just given by the equilibrium value that we have already defined in the last slide. And uh, this will be, uh, you can write it in terms of the number density of photons times some degrees of freedom times some statistical factor according to whether it's a boson or a fermion. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, the same issue will come up in any process in the early universe. You always have to compare the rate of whatever physics you're interested in, whether barogenesis or neutrino decoupling or anything you have to compare it to the Hubble rate. The Hubble rate sets the clock. If you can't do it, what you have to do within a Hubble time, you're out of luck, OK? You have to get on. So as you go into the early universe, the Hubble rate is increasing. You have less and less time to do your business, OK? So this is why uh, there is always a cutoff to any process set by the Hubble rate. In fact, an example I'll give you towards the end will be a calculation of how hot the universe could have ever been, and there'll be a surprise there for you. OK, so these decoupled particles now do not scatter anymore because their rate is smaller than the Hubble rate. So their mean free path is longer than the size of the universe, or the time between scatterings is longer than the age of the universe. Think of it as you prefer, right? But the number in a co-moving volume is therefore conserved, and therefore their distribution function will be invariant under the expansion, the scale factor, because they are non-relativistic. And their phase space distribution keeps the equilibrium form, right? This is true only as long as the particles remain relativistic. So if you are thinking ahead in your head, what about something like neutrinos, which we know have a little mass? They were relativistic at the time when they decoupled, but they're no longer necessarily relativistic now. Well, the answer is that the distribution function of neutrinos will become horrendously complicated. It will not be Fermi Dirac anymore. A lot of people don't realize this. They, so there's a nice paper by uh, Jeremy Bernstein and Feinberg from 1982 or something, which discusses this in detail. Now, subsequently, this temperature Ti will continue to follow the photon temperature. But if something happens that changes the photon temperature and the temperature of all coupled particles, it will not affect the temperature of the decoupled particles. So in other words, these decoupled particles are like inhabiting a separate universe. Okay? It's evolving along with ours, but it has no direct contact with ours. So think of it as some kind of a parallel universe. The temperature in that universe will not change uh, you know, whatever happens in our universe. This means that, for example, if something does happen, let's say electrons and positrons annihilate, it will heat up the photons, but it don't heat up the decoupled particles, for example, neutrinos, so that their temperature will drop below the uh, photon temperature. And correspondingly, the number density of those particles will decrease, right? So these are just words. I'll give you an example later. But keep in mind always that we should focus on what we can actually measure, right? 
I can talk about the temperature of some fiducial decoupled species, but I can't actually measure it. I can only measure the photon temperature. So everything has to be done with reference to photons. In fact, photons turn out to have be very convenient that they dominate the universe because their temperature is easy to measure. It's a scalar and it turns out to be a very good black body. So everything is very neat. Otherwise, you would have been in trouble. Now, how do you actually calculate this? So I'm going to go back to a paper from 1953. This paper is probably one of the best papers ever written in cosmology. It's not very well known, but I would strongly recommend uh, looking it up uh, if you want to see how the whole system was founded. So what they said is, let's break up the pressure into the pressure of interacting species and decoupled species, and similarly for the energy density. Now, the energy conservation equation tells you how the change in the temperature as the universe expands, as the universe cools down, how that will cause work to be done on the system. So this is the equivalence of the energy conservation equation that I wrote down earlier today. I can then rewrite this using this decoupled and interacting species separately. And using the fact that the number of decoupled particles is conserved in, an, in a co-moving volume, so the rate of change of this with temperature is zero, so therefore I have d log a by d, d log t, in other words, 1 by a, a dot uh, dA by, uh, uh, so t over a dA by dt, that goes as one third of d rho i by d log t, okay? This follows from this equation here. If I do that, then I can suggestively combine it with the second law of thermodynamics to write down an adiabat. An adiabat is a connection between the scale factor and the temperature, okay? The scale factor is not observable, okay? Never. We always have to have some proxy for it. So in the morning, we talked about the scale factor being a proxy for uh, redshift. Redshift is observable. You measure a spectral line shift, and that tells you how much the scale factor has changed. Not the absolute scale factor, but only its ratio to something. And similarly, temperature is an observable. Sorry about that. Temperature is an observable. And what we therefore want to do is to relate the scale factor to the temperature. I'm not sure why it's doing that. If it's doing it, not me. It's nothing to do with this. Sorry? Just one, sorry, excuse me one second. Speak loud enough for them to hear me. <laughs> the energy density, thank you, if the energy density plus the, temp, uh, plus the uh, pressure divided by t to the 4 is constant, then I have a relation between the scale factor and the temperatures, okay? at adiabat, and that adiabat allows us to now have a proxy for the scale factor in the temperature. So now we can try to relate epochs where the number of interacting species is different, okay? In other words, when that quantity that I assumed is conserved may not be conserved. So how do I do that? I have to construct something that remains invariant in a co-moving volume. If I can do that, then I can uh, relate the temperature of species which decoupled at a certain epoch to the photon temperature at a different epoch. 
Now, that is the specific entropy and the specific entropy, capital I refers to the sum total of all the individual species. The individual species is the same integral that you saw earlier, except that now I've written it for writing it for pressure plus energy density, okay? And I integrate over phase space as I did before. So basically, I can parameterize all these guys in terms of the corresponding amount for photons. For photons, I know the specific entropy, I know the energy density, I know the number density. They go respectively as T cubed, T to the 4, and uh, T cubed for the number density. And the number of corresponding values for any other species, which is relativistic, is just given in terms of the photon 1 times some number of degrees of freedom, right? And there are the same integrals will be involved depending on if it's fermions or bosons. These are just details. Don't worry about that. It's in the notes. This is just to give you the idea that we know what we are doing, okay? We are keeping track of everything as carefully as we can. So the number of interacting degrees of freedom will be just the sum of the individual species in terms of the total amount of uh, uh, entropy. And similarly, I can define something which is the total number of degrees of freedom which contributes to the energy density. So the point that is being made here is that there are species which may have decoupled, which do not contribute to the number of interacting degrees of freedom, but they do contribute to the total energy density. So, for example, neutrinos, which we mentioned earlier, they might have decoupled. They don't interact any longer with the universe, but they're still around. They're still gravitating. They contribute to the energy density. Right? So we have to keep track of then two kinds of degrees of freedom, those that contribute to the entropy density and those that contribute to the total energy density. Entropy is like a shorthand for saying they interact. So now we can do this calculation of uh, what happens to the temperature of some particle I, which decouples at some temperature Td, and later something happens uh, to the photons, how does it relate to that? So for temperature which is uh, less than the decoupling temperature, the entropy in the decoupled particles and the entropy in the photons, uh, including other interacting particles, they are separately conserved, right? That these particles have decoupled, they're expanding, with the expansion of the universe, they are not interacting anymore, but they still, of course, have uh, you know, entropy content within themselves. And that is basically given by these two expressions here, where I'm just keeping track of the number of decoupled particles and interacting particles. So since the temperatures of the two things were the same at the point when they decoupled, then I can simply work out by solving these equations how the temperature of the decoupled species changes, possibly, with respect to that of the photons at subsequent times. It will be simply the ratio of the number of interacting degrees of uh, freedom at the time of decoupling and the number of degrees of freedom at a later temperature. So if I keep track of the number of degrees of freedom, I can do my bookkeeping, okay? So all this is discussed in a nice paper by uh, uh, Paolo Gondolo and Graciela Gelmini uh, in somewhere in the 90s. So now the number of degrees of freedom specifying the total conserved total entropy will have to keep track of that reduction of the temperature for the decoupled species with respect to the temperature of the interacting species, which is the same as the temperature of photons, because by definition they're in equilibrium with the photons, right? So I'm sorry I'm going through all this rather quickly, but it's very simple algebra, really. It just, there's too many symbols and subscripts here because I'm trying to distinguish between different species and interacting and all that. Okay. So the bottom line is that we have done what we needed to do, or rather Alphen, Follin, and Hermann did it. They constructed a quantity which is conserved in a co-moving volume, regardless of whether the number of species is uh, changing or not. You know, when the temperature drops below some mass threshold, those particles will annihilate. The entropy content in those particles will now be transferred into radiation and into other interacting particles, right? But not into the non-interacting particles. So you have to keep track of that. In the standard model, this is only relevant for neutrinos. But if you are trying to construct cosmologies of uh, new theories of physics beyond the standard model, there often are non-interacting particles and you have to track their thermal history carefully. So, the ratio of the decoupled particle density to the, to the photon density is just related to its value as decoupling in terms of the ratio of the number of degrees of freedom. So basically, the number of photons in a co-moving volume might jump by a certain number, and the number of decoupled particles uh, reduces in ratio to the number of photons by exactly the same factor. Okay? And it, so 
let's bear with me for two more equations and I'll give you an example to make all this clear. The total energy density I can similarly parameterize in terms of the energy density of bosons and fermions. But now I have to take into account that their temperatures may not be the photon temperature. Their temperatures might be reduced from the photon temperature. So this factor allows me to keep track of the fact that there might be decoupled species around which are a little colder than the photons and whose energy density is correspondingly slightly smaller. Right? So the bottom line is that I now have a variant of the adiabat that I gave you before. The adiabat I gave you before A times T equals constant works as long as the number of deg you know, degrees of freedom is the same. Nothing is changing. All particles are in equilibrium. What if the number of uh, interacting species is changing? Then basically that adiabat is altered by this little factor here. Okay? So d log A goes as d log T but minus this d log G S. Okay? So we are doing all this because we want to be able to tell the time. Now, all these things about thermodynamics are not in terms of time, it's in terms of temperature. So, we have to relate the temperature to the time, okay? Because the Hubble parameter is a time derivative. So, time is not an observable. At least, I mean, I can always cook up some dense set of co moving observers carrying clocks. But in practice, I cannot go and ask somebody what's the time, right? But I can measure a temperature. So, I have to relate this to the temperature because the energy density is defined in terms of a temperature. So, if I integrate that equation, therefore, I have to convert time to temperature and using that expression I just gave you, which relates the scale factor to the temperature and the number of degrees of interacting degrees of freedom, I can now integrate this, right? So, now I have written root 8 pi g rho as 1 over mp square, like right? Planck mass, this is for, you know, it's just easier to calculate in energy units if you do that. And therefore, the time is the integral of that G rho is the total number of degrees of freedom contributing to the total energy density, right? And then I have this factor which follows from the fact that I have to translate between uh, the scale factor and uh, uh, the temperature, and that is going to give me a factor which treats track of whether the number of interacting degrees of freedom has changed, okay? But this is an exact expression. What we do is we look at this expression and we say let us look only at when this thing is more or less constant and this is zero and then I can integrate it very simply and I get that the time is about you know one over square of the temperature numerically the time is one second when the temperature is one MeV okay of that order there is also a 2.4 divided by square root of G rho which is roughly one right so this is very easy now if you ask me what was the temperature uh, and time relationship in the early universe, I'll tell you that it was one second at a MeV. If I go to a GeV, then that is GeV by MeV is 10 to the 3, square is 10 to the 6. So the temperature time then was 10 to the minus 6 seconds. Okay? If I go to a 100 GeV, then the uh, uh, time at that time, uh, at that point is 100 GeV over MeV, which is 10 to the 5 uh, inverse square, 10 to the minus 10 seconds. So now we know how those people in the drawing office at CERN and Fermilab make those charts. That's how we tell, tell the time. You know the quark hadron phase transition occurred about a microsecond after the Big Bang. The uh, electroweak phase transition occurred at about 10 to the minus 10 seconds. Actually, 10 to the minus 11 because you have to keep track of that. So we can basically work out all these things. And in particular, if you tell me that there is some new physics, you know, supersymmetry, extra dimensions, whatever, I can work out the thermal history for that as well, right? So uh, this is just the classic example that is given of uh, all this stuff I've been talking about in the context of the standard model, where the only particles that decouple while remaining relativistic are neutrinos. So the cross-section for neutrino scattering basically goes as gf square e square. They're relativistic, so I can trade E for T. And the number density goes as T cube. So therefore, the total rate is going as T cube times T square, so T to the 5. Okay. Now, this has to be compared with the expansion rate, which, as I told you, is going as T squared over the Planck scale. Right? H is going as T squared by MP. So therefore, you can see that if I equate these two, then basically I have one factor of T, uh, which is, uh, sorry, T cube. T square and T, this T to the 5 cancel to give T cube. So T is therefore GF square Planck mass to the minus one third. 
So that is a some combination of the weak scale coupling and the gravitational coupling that gives you coincidentally some energy scale which is characteristic of uh, nuclei. Okay, this will turn out to be very interesting when you study nucleosynthesis. So at this time, the number of neutrinos is just three quarters the number of photons because the temperatures are the same, they have still not decoupled, and the number of neutrinos, uh, the, the degrees of freedom is two, right? There are left-handed neutrinos and right-handed anti-neutrinos. There are no right-handed neutrinos or left-handed anti-neutrinos, right? Uh, because, the, uh, well, that's the V minus A structure of the weak interactions. Of course, if they were Dirac, if neutrinos did have a Dirac mass, the right-handed states are not interacting. Uh, at least they don't interact through the usual W. But you could populate them if, for example, neutrinos had a magnetic moment. So, you know, you'll find papers in the literature about how you can populate those states. Or just from scattering, whenever particles with mass scatter, there is a probability of m nu square over the temperature of populating the wrong helicity. So there are many studies of what happens to massive neutrinos which discuss those issues. But for us, it's very simple. We have just two degrees of freedom. And then when, as the temperature drops below half a MeV, this is one MeV, so just a little bit below electrons and positrons will annihilate. They'll annihilate almost totally, as we'll see later, because they have electromagnetic coupling, and that's enough to basically wipe each other out. Nothing is left, almost nothing is left. When they do that, they dump all their energy content into the photons. But the neutrinos don't know because they have already decoupled. So the number of degrees of freedom is changing from photons plus E plus E minus, that is total of 11 by 2, taking account of that factor for fermions and bosons, to just two, just photons. So therefore, the ratio of this is 4 over 11. And that is going to be the ratio of the number density of the neutrinos, sorry, the photons to the number density of photons below the phase transition to that above. And that is therefore the same ratio for the number of neutrinos to the number of photons. It goes as 4 over 11, right? And in fact, uh, the net ratio is 3 over 11 because there is a 3 fourth factor there because of fermions versus bosons. And so you see, I can calculate the number of degrees of freedom characterizing the entropy density below the um, mass of the electron. I still have photons, but the neutrinos now have a lower temperature. And this is 4 over 11 to the 1 third. So to the cube, that gives me a factor of 4 over 11. So I get some number like that. And similarly for the energy density. So you can see that with some confidence, I can work out the thermal history of the universe based on the particles that I know about. So all I now have to do, now that I've got the prescription, is I have to ask you, what is the matter content of the universe? You tell me according to your favorite Lagrangian, I'll tell you the thermal history, right? Basically, I just count all the number of relativistic degrees of freedom, and then I keep track of when they annihilate and dump their uh, energy into photons. And of course, since I know that you know, field theory is not an ideal gas, I have to keep track of phase transitions. So before you knew very much about phase transitions, this is the kind of diagram we used to draw, which shows the number of degrees of freedom as a function of the temperature. At high temperatures, the number of degrees of freedom characterizing the energy density and the entropy density are the same. In the standard model, they only deviate from each other below the electron mass, for the reason I've given you. There is a big jump at the quark-hadron phase transition, because suddenly you have liberated all the uh, partons so, and there are three colors, so there is a lot of quarks and gluons around, which later at lower temperature would be all confined uh, into bound states. So that's a very big jump. That's the biggest jump that happens, biggest thing that happens. Then you have smaller things to do. It's a mu annihilation and stuff like that. At higher temperatures, you'll have annihilation of B quarks, top quarks. You have the electric phase transition and so forth. We didn't really know how this transition occurs. So this is in some MIT bag model or something. And this is the kind of favored value now. But we, of course, have now have precise values from the lattice. So this is a table of how the number of degrees of freedom changes according to uh, the temperature. And all the various mass thresholds are shown. So what, I want, what is highlighted here is that there is a big jump here in the number of degrees of freedom at about 150 MeV because of the confinement of free quarks and gluons uh, at that point. And uh, if you go up, well, nothing much happens in the electric phase transition. In fact, nothing happens at the electric phase transition because the 
as you know, the, the, the longitudinal mode of the Ws and Zs is precisely what comes from the Higgs. It's the Higgs effect, uh, Higgs mechanism. So the number of degrees of freedom does not change. The Ws and Zs were massless in the earlier universe. They become massive. They just take on those two degrees of freedom. Right? So actually, weak interactions, in principle, become long range okay, in the early universe when the electric symmetry is restored. Um, uh, actually, it would be long range if it was not for the fact that you're in a thermal plasma. So there is a screening length, but there is no intrinsic limit to the range of the Ws and Zs. So start thinking about what would that mean? What if weak interactions were long range? What would happen in the early universe? These are all things to worth thinking about. The quark hadron thing just becomes an ideal gas, okay, and a very dilute gas too. So there's not much going on there. And in fact, even the electric phase transition, according to the, our lattice friends, is actually very, very dull. If the, it was the case that the Higgs was very, very light, then you would have a strongly first order phase transition. However, for any Higgs mass more than 50 GeV, it's very boring. There is no phase transition at all. It's what they call a crossover. And effectively, nothing happens. There is no entropy release. The number of degrees of freedom doesn't change. Nothing happens in the electric phase transition, right? Of course, the precise effect of electric symmetry breaking might still have cosmological consequences. So for example, if you're thinking of the um, freeze out of a heavy particle, which we'll discuss later, if that particle gets some of its mass from the Higgs mechanism, then it may not have got its entire mass by the time that freeze out happens. Okay? These are things one needs to think about. The zero temperature mass of a particle today is not the same as its mass in the early universe. It depends on where it's getting its mass from. Is it getting it from supersymmetry breaking? Is it getting it from the Higgs? One has to keep track of all these things. Yes? Sorry? Yeah? No? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. What kind of observables allows us to track this, this, this history? Yeah. Just the counting argument I gave you earlier. That is to say, I start from what I know. I have photons and three species of uh, But it's just uh, theoretical or? Theoretical, yes. It measures the entropy not. But we know that photons exist. We know that they have a left-handed polarized state and a right-handed polarized state. So it is experimental, but I'm relying on the last 200 years of experiment. I didn't do it specially for this. Okay, thank okay. you. And similarly, neutrinos. If you bring in some new physics, then of course you'll have to include them in this table. These are all the things that we know simply from the fact that these are well-known fermions with well-known properties. Right? So yes, uh, I mean, it is as reliable as our understanding of basic Fermi boson statistics. Okay? There's no, no ambiguity there. Now, here is something interesting, which I hope will surprise you. It does surprise uh, many of my colleagues. So you could ask, you talk about a hot early universe. What is the highest temperature that the universe could have had? By temperature, I mean you know, state of thermal equilibrium, obviously. So let us do the exercise. We are to always equate a scattering rate to an expansion rate. We know the expansion rate. We have already discussed that. H is going as t squared over the Planck scale. How does the scattering rate go? Well, at sufficiently high temperatures, when you know, everything is relativistic, it will basically go as some coupling square. And the only dimensional way to construct a cross section is to say it's alpha squared by t squared. That is the only dimensionful quantity. So the number density is going as t cubed. This is going as alpha squared by t squared. So this is going as alpha squared times t. And this immediately should let, set the warm, warning bells ringing because the Hubble parameter is going as t squared. This is going as t. Clearly, this will start falling behind the Hubble rate at some point. In fact, when you do the exercise precisely, you see that this thing is going as t. This thing is going as t squared. So there is a crossing point. And that crossing point temperature is about 10 to the minus 4 of the Planck scale. Okay? If I take some unified value for this coupling and the number of degrees of freedom would be about 200. Uh, so I'm sorry, I'm using G star rather than G rho. This is more conventionally used. Right? So if I take this seriously, then what that means is that the universe never even got as hot as the gut scale. Doesn't matter what you do. The universe was expanding so fast, if it was a state of thermal equilibrium, that it would have cooled down. It could not have got into equilibrium at the gut scale. 
This is interesting because in the old days, people used to talk about baryogenesis at the gut scale, heavy bosons, gut scale bosons being in equilibrium and then falling out of equilibrium, decaying, doing all kinds of things. That could never have happened. And the answer is, uh, of course, when you look back at the literature, this estimate was made, but people sort of didn't put in all the factors properly. So they got some number like 10 to the 15 Jev rather than 10 to the 14. And of course, at that time, the gut scale was 10 to the 15. This is 1980s, right? This is pre-Suzy. And uh, so basically, it looked like it was all OK. But actually, it is not OK. Now, there is clear water between the maximum temperature that you can heat up to and the gut scale. And in fact, these gentlemen have actually worked out the precise value taking into account that the coupling is also temperature dependent. And if you do that, then you get 310 to the 14 GeV as the highest temperature to which the universe could have ever heated up. So this has a implications also for other things, for example, for topological defects. So there is this so-called kibble mechanism for the generation of topological defects. In fact, in this very auditorium, I heard Tom Kibble talk about it in the 80s, which is the idea that as the universe cools down you know, below the, some scale where uh, you have a big group breaking to U1, and you would create, if the homotopy group pi, three, uh, pi 1 is non-trivial, you would generate these topological uh, defects, and you'd make one per horizon, et cetera. None of that is going to happen. You'd, you could still make monopoles by other means, but not by the cable mechanism. So this is just to illustrate to you that in a very well-covered, well-traveled territory, there are sometimes surprises. You should start doing little calculations to see if all that works. OK, so at this point, I therefore have set the stage for discussing Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which is happening over there at about a second after the Big Bang, uh, made famous by Weinberg's book, First Three Minutes. It actually goes on for about half an hour. So Big Bang nucleosynthesis is seeking to address the question, where do all the elements in the universe come from? This is the distribution of all the elements in the universe as a function of atomic number. And you have no doubt seen it in nuclear physics courses, where people tell you that, you know, say R and P, this is because this is the most stable nucleus here. Helium is the most stable nucleus there. There are many other elements. There are some things like uh, lithium, beryllium, boron, which are very, very low down uh, in the interstellar medium, because these things are not very stable nuclei. So this is like an inverted plot of the binding energy of the nuclei. The understanding that we have today is that all these guys can be made in stars in the last second of a stellar explosion in a type 2 supernova. The huge flux of neutrons will undergo rapid neutron capture along the value of stability and below it and create all these elements. Okay? And this was written down in a famous paper by the two Burbages, Fowler and Hoyle, back in 1957. But what they realized was that they could not make helium by this process. Because although stars make helium, the sun is making helium, but helium is about 10% by number, 25% by mass. And every time you make helium, you release gamma rays, right, of a few MeV energy. So if you took the present day universe and tried to convert 25% of it to helium by mass, you generate a gamma ray background, which would be enough to wipe us all out. So you cannot make helium in stars. Right? The only way you can do it is to make that process sufficiently far back in the past that the gamma rays are redshifted. And that is exactly what we see today as the microwave background radiation. Okay? So helium and hydrogen are the residuals of the Big Bang with a little trace of lithium-7. But we don't see anything of the other heavy elements. Now, this is often credited to George Gamma. And since many of you are graduate students, I thought I'd put in a little anecdote about uh, supervisors and graduate students. So actually, Gamma, in fact, wrote this famous paper in Nature. This, this is from 48, Dr. George Gamma. And he goes on about how he uh, can work out the, the synthesis of the elements in the first moments of the early universe. He also quoted in there a value for the temperature of the relic radiation, which was actually wrong. It was 6 degrees Kelvin much higher than the upper bound that had then been placed by an engineer called Ohm at the Bell Laboratories, uh, where later it was subsequently discovered. Ohm had put an upper bound of 2 plus minus 1 degree. And Zeldovich and uh, uh, his uh, students saw that and decided that the universe could not have started from a hot Big Bang, because somebody had put an upper bound on it below the limit uh, 
below the number estimated by Gamma. But the truth is that Gamma was a brilliant guy. He had great ideas, but he couldn't calculate too well. He left it to his graduate students. Okay? In particular, this chap, Alpha, he was the guy who, in fact, did most of the calculations. You saw him earlier. And he also worked with Herman, who must be the more distinguished looking chap here. So Gamma was talking about an element called Yelem, which was supposed to be the, you know, it's, it's, it's his own made up word for the primordial matter from which everything was created. So what's interesting is that they published a paper in 1948 in which they spelled all this out. But there was a prior paper which Gamma had published just a little bit earlier with Alpha, Bete, and Gamma. And the funny thing is that Bete had nothing to do with it whatsoever. He was roped in just to get a fun title for the paper, for the authors. And they left out poor uh, Herman because he refused to change his name to Delta. <laughs> so the real credit, I think, for the hot Big Bang and primordial nucleosynthesis should go to Mr. Ralph Alpha, who was at the time a graduate student. Uh, and this was, in fact, uh, the paper that I already quoted to you earlier, which told us how to calculate the temperature of decoupled species in terms of the still interacting species. 1953, but this is a very good paper. Some papers are worth rereading in cosmology. Unfortunately, not all of them. Right? But their uh, realization followed a very crucial point that Hayashi, Japanese physicist, had made that uh, neutrons and protons could be in chemical equilibrium in the early universe. That's what you're now going to discuss. Not kinetic, but chemical equilibrium with an example. And just as an aside, Alpha was finally awarded a medal, although I think for doing something as impressive as that, for the prediction that the expansion leaves behind background radiation, he was the first to calculate that. And for providing the model for the Big Bang Theory, you know, you would have thought it deserved, uh, well, I'm sure this is an impressive medal, but you know, I would have given him something bigger than that. Okay? But at least he was rewarded before he died. Now, weak interactions. So this, as I said, goes back to the work of Hayashi, Alpha Follin, and Herman, and then many distinguished cosmologists, Jim Peebles, Bob Wagner at Stanford, Peebles at Princeton, and Ralph Fowler and Fred Hoyle, who was at Cambridge. They kind of put this together. This is very important. It's nuclear physics. It's very old, but it's very important because the foundation of modern cosmology rests on all this. And even today, this is the most reliable part of cosmology that we can talk about. So the dramatis personae, as I've told you before, are the photons, the neutrinos, and the electrons and positrons at around MeV. Neutrons and protons are going to be in a weak equilibrium because they can change into each other through the weak interactions. right? So the number of neutrons to the number of protons is going to be just given by a statistical factor. Chemical equilibrium, because they are undergoing a chemical reaction, if you think of it as a chemical reaction. right? And of course, the reverse processes are proceeding at exactly the same rate. That is the nature of detailed balance. Now, the one thing that we have inherited from the early universe at this point is a ratio of baryons to photons at some tiny number. It's like 10 to the minus 10. Okay? Why that is so, we don't know. The point is that all the baryons have already annihilated with each other and turned into radiation. But one baryon has been left over for every 10 to the 9 pairs. Why that is so, Wilfred Buchmuller will tell you about tomorrow. Right? Right, Wilfred? OK. But I'm just going to take it as an initial condition. So what is the weak rate? The weak rate is precisely what we computed earlier for the freeze out of neutrinos. It's basically going as gf squared times e squared, which is gf squared times t squared, times tq for the number density. So it's going as gf times t to the 5. And the expansion rate is going as t squared by the Planck scale. So if I equate those two, now I get that the freeze out temperature goes as gn over gf squared to the 1 third, just as I got for neutrinos. And that's about the MeV. Okay? That's the temperature. 1 MeV, the time is 1 second. We have calculated that already. right? So from a state of weak equilibrium, we have got to the point where neutrons and protons are freezing out. What Hayashi had pointed out was something very important. Once you reach a state of thermal equilibrium, you do not have an arrow of time. You erase the memory of the past. So you can do a meaningful calculation at 1 MeV in the early universe without knowing anything about what happened earlier, what happened at the Planck scale. You don't care about it. What happened at the gut scale, electric scale, none of that matters. You have got into equilibrium. There's no arrow of time. 
Therefore, this is a very sound calculation precisely because of that. So although the universe is expanding and evolving, to a very good approximation at each point, we can consider it to be in a state of quasi-equilibrium. And that makes our job calculating things very, very simple. Because the full non-equilibrium problem would be horrendous. I mean, nobody would attempt it. So now that I've made neutrons and protons, their number ratio will be of order one, because the temperature, the mass difference between neutrons and protons is also of order one MeV. Okay? This is very curious. There is no reason why the neutron-proton mass difference has to be of the same order in order to give me a reasonable neutron fraction, which is neither 1 nor 0. You can see it's exponentially sensitive. And what we'll see later in the last lecture is that this is interesting because the freeze-out temperature is determined by the gravitational coupling versus the weak coupling. The neutron-proton mass difference is determined by the strong interactions and the electromagnetic interactions. So all four fundamental interactions are involved in determining that number to which it's exponentially sensitive, right? So now you can see that even this humble process can allow us to put a really tight constraint on variations of fundamental couplings in the early universe, any change from what you measured today in the laboratory and so on. So there is, however, a little problem. Even after neutrons and protons have gone out of equilibrium, they will try to combine to make elements and the first element they'll try to make is deuterium. This is the weakest bound element. So that photon is 2.2 MeV, uh, OK? Of course, if I had a 2.2 MeV gamma around, that can break up deuterium again and give me back neutrons and protons, right? Now, you might think that nucleosynthesis therefore should start as soon as the temperature drops below 2.2 MeV, right? But in fact, it doesn't. You have to wait a lot longer. Why is that? That's because even when the temperature drops below 2.2 MeV, the average temperature, so if you have a black body photon distribution like that, the average temperature of these photons, right, is not exa it's exactly, it's 2.7 times T if you do the integral over the, for the average energy. So if this is 2.2 MeV, the average temperature is what, whatever it is, 6 MeV, right? So I have to wait for the temperature to drop further. But even if the temperature has, let's say, dropped to 0.1 MeV, what about this wean tail here? I can, so even if the average temperature here is, say, 0.1 MeV, I can go to 2.2 MeV in the tail, right? This is an exponential distribution. This is going as e to the h mu by t, right? But even though the number of photons is dropping exponentially, there are so many of the photons relative to the nuclei that I can afford to take a hit by going deep into the wean tail before the number of photons become so small that I can't find one of them to break up my deuteron. Right. How far do I have to go? Well, if I go to 10 times temperature, e to the minus 10 is 10 to the minus 3. I have to go to e to the minus 30, because then that's 10 to the minus 9. That is roughly the ratio of uh, uh, baryons to photons. So basically, the temperature at which nucleosynthesis starts will be given by this 2.2 MeV divided by the log of the baryon to photon ratio. That is simply reflecting the fact that even when the photons here are too cold to do this reverse process, there are photons in the tail which still can do it. And so I have to drop a lot in temperature. This is the same reason when, when the universe combines, becomes neutral, it doesn't happen at 13.6 electron volts. It happens at about 30 times smaller temperature because it's basically a photon gas. Well, once you start, which is at 0 0.07 MeV, if you do here, if I put in eta, which I've put in here, you can see this is happening much later. At that time, uh, the time is three minutes. This is the title of Weinberg's book. And uh, meanwhile, of course, the neutrons have been beta decaying. They've gone down to 1 seventh because uh, neutron lifetime is about 10 minutes. And then basically all the neutrons get bound in helium because helium is the most stable nucleus around. And therefore, the abundance of helium by mass is just twice the neutron to proton fraction because two neutrons make up one helium nucleus with two protons. And then there's a little leftover trace of all these things here, right? But you don't make any heavy nuclei because it's a very dilute system. The density of the universe at the time of nucleosynthesis is the density of the air in this room, okay? You didn't know that, did you? It's extremely dilute system which is why we can do this simple calculation. There are no many body effects. 
there is no fancy filtrical calculate complications it's a dilute gas it's even less more dilute than the sun so a it is dilute so you don't have to worry about three body processes b it is expanding very fast so you have to do everything within one second okay and that is why you don't make anything else you just make hydrogen you just make helium the hydrogen i have taken for granted okay and this is the reaction network which shows you basically that everything is happening around here okay there's a little leakage through to these things but there are no stable nuclei with a of 5 or a of 8 so it doesn't actually propagate through except in exotic cosmologies if you have an exotic cosmology where there are i don't know isocurvature perturbations or something like that you could make heavy elements so then the observational absence of heavy elements allows you to put constraints on those possibilities right so this was all worked out and bob wagner wrote a nice code uh, in the late 60s and then more recently this has become a precision tool because do and dikers and collaborators worked out that all this is happening in a plasma so when i talk about all these things like the electron mass i have to talk about the finite temperature finite density corrections etc to the reaction rates uh, dave seckel pointed out that the nuclear uh, nucleon recoil corrections are quite important and so on so on so basically the cross sections for this this uh, reactions are uh, have to be measured they're not measured at the right temperature but you can do all this together so basically the bottom line is this uh, itinerary of events when the time is shorter than 15 seconds the temperature is high enough that basically you just have protons electrons other particles so they are essentially there is no heavy nuclei at that time as in the temperature has dropped enough that deuterium can survive but helium still hasn't formed then you get to 3 minutes deuterium survives make helium nothing else happens trace amounts of lithium as an aside when weinberg wrote his book he recounts somewhere at that time the 3 minutes is of course set by the rate of expansion but at that time people only knew about two neutrinos the electron and the muon neutrino so the actual time scale corresponding to nucleosynthesis was 2 and 1/2 minutes but apparently his publisher told him you know it would sound much better if he called his book the first 3 minutes rather than the first 2 and 1/2 minutes right and later we did discover the tau neutrino and it's bang on it's 3 minutes so you know that was very nice so by about half an hour the universe has got too dilute to do anything nuclear synthesis is complete okay so we make predictions and the predictions are based on looking at the abundance of these elements starting from some very high temperature where they're essentially negligible you can see the log scale here we just have neutrons and protons and they are combining into deuterium into helium so what is finally left over is this uh, line of helium which is this where is helium this this cyan line you can see it is growing from being almost negligible it grows up there and that is the final value it is comparable to the leftover protons and the next many orders of magnitude below that you have a little leftover trace of deuterium that is this green line here and even smaller than that there is a bit of this lithium which is uh, down there somewhere okay the this line of so beryllium 7 decays into lithium after few, half an hour they are the same so this is the first three minutes and what do you have to now do is to put this on a precision footing if you want to actually use it to constrain new physics for example um, you know somebody might come along and tell me i have some model with very massive particles which are already gravitationally coupled to the standard model and they only decay through some dimension 5 operator the lifetime is of order days or months you know can you say anything about it and i say sure if it is days or months then some fraction of them would still start decaying right from the beginning during the first three minutes and they might have a measurable impact on the synthesis of the elements so i have to measure cross sections like this and these are the important cross sections relevant for nuclear synthesis and i have to measure those cross sections and uh, determine uh, therefore the rate at which those nuclear reactions will proceed and you can see that the situation is not very good most of these cross sections are not particularly well measured uh, some of them also are relevant to the solar neutrino problem so that gave a spur for them to be better measured and then there are large uncertainties so then you have to estimate the error bands by using monte carlo methods so basically what you can do is to run a monte carlo many 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 times and then get the matrix of output results and try to relate them to the input parameters 
And this is done by constructing a so-called covariance matrix, for those of you who know about these things, which essentially encodes all the encodes the change in the input parameters, which are generically called y, as a function of the, uh, sorry, the output parameters, which are the abundances, as a function of the input parameters, which are all these reaction rates, right? And once I quantify them, then what I can do is I can give you a nice visualization of how the abundance of any particular element changes according to a change in the cross-section for the relevant reaction. So you can easily read off from this that this particular reaction is the most important for determining how the abundance of deuterium changes, okay? This reaction doesn't matter at all because, you see, there is a complex chain of processes, so you have to work out what is actually important to measure, what is important to get tighter values for in order that our predictions can be precise. And you can see in general that the lithium abundance has got very large error bars. It's affected by a lot of reactions. The helium abundance, which is here, less so, okay? The actual change in the, with respect to deuterium is very, very small. So what that means is that when I plot these abundances uh, in the traditional plot where the helium abundance is called Y for some reason by astronomers, uh, and it's shown on a linear plot, and the abundance of deuterium and lithium-7 are shown on log plots, so that's nearly 10 orders of magnitude. And over 10 orders of magnitude, I can predict what the abundances should be as a function of the baryon to photon ratio, which is uh, of order 10 to the minus 10, but I don't know the precise value. And you can see that the helium abundance is nearly constant because that is determined mainly by the weak interactions, the freeze-out value of neutrons to protons. But the deuterium and the lithium abundance are strong functions uh, because this is, these are now log scales. They're strong functions of the baryon to photon ratio. And these are the corresponding uncertainties. So for helium, the uncertainty is very, very small. It's less than 1%, whereas uh, for deuterium, it's of order 10%, for lithium-7, it can be 30-40%. Now, this is all numerical stuff, and there is a standard Monte Carlo. You can download it and run it on your laptop. But it's always nice to get some analytic kind of feel for how things are going. And courtesy of these gentlemen, uh, Diomopoulos and collaborators, uh, we have an analytic description, which is very interesting. See how simple it is, and this will be a good training for you if you want to set up a similar approximation to complicated kinetics in a different context. So the rate of change of any species X is determined by the balance between at what rate it is being created and at what rate it is being destroyed, right? You agree with that. The rate of destruction is proportional to the abundance itself, because obviously if I want to destroy something, I have to hit the bloody thing, and you know, the number of the particles is the abundance. So if I ask, what is the equilibrium value? The equilibrium value is just J over gamma, because in equilibrium, dx by dt is 0, right? That's trivial. OK, so that was trivial. The general green function is not so trivial, but I'll leave you to work that out for yourself, OK? That in general, you would have to have an integral over time of the kernel for this uh, particular reaction here. So, what they observed was that if this condition is respected, if the logarithmic rate of the source and the logarithmic rate of change of the sink are comparable and such that the difference is much, much smaller than the overall rate, right, then you can achieve a sort of quasi-equilibrium, even though the system is evolving, for all practical purposes, it is in equilibrium, sufficiently that one can work out what the abundances are without actually having to solve any uh, numerical code, okay? And freeze out then would happen as usual when gamma is of order H and the asymptotic abundance would be the abundance at the freeze out temperature. So that is just the ratio of the source rate by the sink rate at the freeze out temperature. Of course, to do this, you have to identify what are the important sources and sinks for any given element or if you're thinking in a different context for whatever it is that you are interested in, right? But this thing works. Look at that timeline that I showed you earlier, which is from the numerical calculation. And now you have these red dotted lines, okay, which is from the simple analytic calculation. They get deuterium, et cetera, to within a factor of two, and they get helium to within a few percent. And it's a very simple analytic calculation. Okay? And that means that you don't have to you know, waste computer time unless you are required to by obliged by your contract to use computer time. You don't need to waste computer time, right? Just do it analytically. 
And the advantage of this is that I can now use that, what they have determined, to try to work out things that we are interested in. For example, what is the limit on the number of neutrino species from nucleosynthesis? Right? So of course, we know that there are three types of left-handed doublet neutrinos which couple to the Z and its width is precisely measured. But there could be other kinds of neutrinos, singlets, which don't couple to the Z. Okay, there could be heavier neutrinos which are kinematically not accessible to the Z, uh, although that they would be relativistic. But there could be other particles. There could be other relativistic particles. There could be a very strong graviton background and so on. So we characterize all that in terms of an effective number of neutrino species. And what that calculation, what, what you have just done, tells me is that because I know the time temperature relationship, which is this, and I know the rate of change of a given abundance goes in terms of the cross-section as so, I can write down a invariant, a degener I can find a degeneracy. Log eta minus half log g star is a constant, okay? Which means that on that plot that I showed you earlier, a shift in the baryon to photon ratio is equivalent to a shift in the number of degrees of freedom, right? So therefore, I can read off without having to do any Monte Carloing, et cetera, et cetera. I can just calculate by simple chi-square statistics, which all of us know, how to work out the number of degrees of freedom in terms of that covariance matrix that I showed you earlier, okay? This is just a technical issue because there's a code that we gave for this which can be easily used and uh, you can work out how to, in fact, determine the limit on the number of, uh, number of neutrinos from measured uh, values of the abundances. So what you need for this is the values of those abundances, okay? These Ys. How do you measure cosmic abundances? You want primordial abundances, okay? And today is definitely not primordial. We are, you know, 14, 13, whatever billion years after the Big Bang. So the technique that is used, and this is something you need to know a little bit about because many of us are interested in limits on new physics. So we should really pay attention to the observables from which those limits are deduced so you can have some feel at least for how reliable or unreliable they are, right? I mean, when you get a result from a collider, you say there are 3,000 guys working on it. They probably know what they're doing. Let's just take it. And even then, they don't always get it right, okay? But here, you will find that there are maybe 10 people in the entire world who measured the primordial helium abundance, which is a quantity of prime importance for uh, the number of neutrinos. You measure that by looking at uh, very old galaxies. They are blue because they don't have star formation. The star formation has ceased long ago, so the color is not red as it would be for a galaxy with star formation. Quasars allow us to light up, uh, well, they light up clouds of gas along the line of sight called the Lyman Alpha Forest. And using big 10 meter class telescopes, you can actually look for absorption lines due to deuterium in those clouds. That has become possible. For lithium, we can only look at very old stars in our own galaxy, which are so-called population two stars. They orbit around the galaxy. They're part of some primordial uh, uh, spheroidal halo. And uh, people believe that they have seen some lithium in them, which turns out to be interesting. I'll dwell on that because there is a possible anomaly with the lithium abundance. It doesn't quite agree with the Big Bang nucleosynthesis calculation. And any number of papers have been written implicating new physics, decaying particles to explain the lithium problem. Maybe when I show you the actual data on lithium, you might have a second thought about how unlikely or unlikely that is. So first, let me show you about helium. Helium is pretty straightforward. Helium is made in stars, like our sun, right? But when the sun makes helium, it also makes other heavy elements. So if I plot the amount of helium that I measure versus the amount of some other heavy element like oxygen or nitrogen, I see that it's basically almost flat. There is a slight slope. You see, this is slightly bigger than that. But over quite a wide range of oxygen, it has hardly changed. So this is suggesting that the helium, uh, most of the helium that we see in the universe is primordial. We just have to correct for this little extra creation in stars. By the way, on this scale, the sun would be somewhere out there, okay? These are very, very old stars with very little uh, formation of helium. Now, these are some measurements of the helium abundance by two or three groups of people. They disagree with each other outside their quoted uncertainties, okay? 
they are all using different methods because to measure an abundance, you have to know the temperature and the density of the plasma that is emitting the radiation. You have to know whether it's in local thermal equilibrium and so on, right? These are, this is what astronomers know how to do and they do it, but each one does it in their own way and clearly uh, there must be some unknown systematic because otherwise these numbers should agree with each other within the quoted error bars and the don't. So I have the unenviable task on the particle data group of trying to make sense of these measurements and to recommend some value, okay? And the value that we recommend is this one here, which might give you uh, some thought because it looks very precise, but actually the uncertainty, we have, you see here, we have multiplied it considerably over the quoted uncertainty by these guys who claim to have determined it as precisely as is possible. Anyway, don't worry about it, but I'm saying that there are large systematic uncertainties so we have to do better. The deuterium abundance is uh, uh, interesting. This has only become possible because when I look towards a quasar uh, in the, through this Lyman alpha forest, you see absorption lines due to clouds along the line of sight, which are short of Lyman alpha. This is actually Lyman alpha. It's at 6,000 angstroms rather than at whatever it is, 900 angstroms, because this is a highly redshifted quasar. Okay? It's redshifted by a factor of five. So five plus one, six times one is 6,000. So these ones, if I blow up one of these lines, it looks like that. This is the line of hydrogen. And in the wing of the hydrogen line, there's a little dip here. That is due to deuterium. The shift of deuterium, the isotopic shift is about 80 kilometers a second. And to see that, you have to be, have a huge telescope to see that little guy there, right? Also observe that hydrogen is saturated. This Strength is so strong that you, know, you can't actually measure the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen because you can't measure the hydrogen. You only see the deuterium. And when you do all this stuff, which you do with a big telescope like that, so this is only possible if you happen to live in California and then have time on the Keck telescopes because they only give time on the telescope to happy Californians, okay? And so these guys have managed to measure that little, little dip there and they have been able to determine the deuterium abundance. But the deuterium abundance seems to be all over the place, right? I mean, this is now a linear scale, but still, you can see there's at least a factor of two to three scatter. This is the abundance in the interstellar medium, and it does appear that what we are looking at could have been depleted from some primordial value, even though you're looking in a Lyman alpha cloud at a redshift of two or three, there are still heavy elements in those clouds. There has been some star formation, some supernovae, Deuterium could have been destroyed. It's very fragile. So we don't know what is the cause of this dispersion, what it correlates with. This is an attempt to see if it correlates with some heavy element. We don't know any of this. But very recently, uh, Max Patini and company at uh, uh, the Institute of Astronomy at Cambridge, they have managed to look at some particular systems called damped Lyman alpha systems, where that hydrogen column density can be precisely measured. It's not saturated and then they can determine this D over H, and they have given us a very precise value, okay? So if I put that together, then I'll be able to determine the baryon to photon ratio, but first let me tell you about lithium, since this has launched a very large number of phenomenology papers claiming that there is evidence for new physics. So in population two stars, old stars in the galaxy, I observed that the lithium abundance for very high temperatures seems to be on some constant plateau. And similarly, if I observe versus the amount of metallicity of the star, I observe that again, there's a huge scatter here. So our sun is, for example, here. But if I go to very metal poor stars, this is the log scale, then again, I see some kind of a plateau. And uh, two French astronomers, Speeth and Speeth, claimed that this was evidence that this was primordial in origin, right? That lithium is very easily broken up by all kinds of nonsense that goes on in stars, convection, turbulence, what have you. But if you see a plateau, then that is evidence of primordial origin, right? So if you put it all that together, then you have some numbers for deuterium, for lithium, etc. We can't use the helium-3 because that can be both created and destroyed. You don't know how it goes. So if we take all that and put it on the plot that I showed you earlier, this is now what we get. That huge yellow band is our estimate of the systematic abundance on the measurement of the helium abundance, okay? It could be anything we think between 23% and 26.5%. The deuterium abundance, similarly, sorry, it's here. The deuterium abundance is much more precisely known 
that is the measurement in that Lyman alpha forest. And the lithium abundance is somewhere around here. And this, we can see that these two agree, OK, with a baryon to photon ratio, which is something like, uh, what is it, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times 10 to the minus 10. And that is the 95% confidence range if I do a systematic uh, you know, likelihood analysis. Okay? Lithium does not affect that too much because the uncertainties are so large that it doesn't affect the likelihood. Right? The reason why we believe that that is the right number is because now we have an independent determination from the cosmic microwave background, which is that purple band, bang on. Right? This is extremely fortunate. This is extremely fortunate because this is a measurement of the baryon to photon ratio. I'll explain shortly how it does that. At about a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, that is a measurement of the baryon to photon ratio at a few seconds after the Big Bang. So there is no reason why the two have to be the same. Something could have happened in between. Right? But if the two agree, then barring some, you know, some, some conspiracy, it must be the same. And one then supports the other. So it's a cyclic argument, but it kind of holds together. Though it is not a good idea to combine the two because we don't know that they are actually reflecting the same process. Now, this is very interesting immediately because the value of the baryon to photon ratio here is much shorter. It's sort of 0 0.02 or something. It's much short of what it takes for critical density and even short of what it takes to make up the matter content of the universe, which is about, uh, in these units, about six times bigger. Right? So it is evidence for dark matter. It is actually also evidence for baryonic dark matter because the actual amount of baryons we can see shining in light is about a factor of three times smaller. So most of the baryons in the universe are dark. Okay? At least three quarters of them are dark. They're not emitting any light. But more interestingly, the baryons cannot make up the dark matter because the dark matter uh, is got a baryon uh, matter density, which is about six times bigger than this. Okay? So immediately, this is telling us two very interesting things. This is of interest to astronomers. This is of very much interest to particle physicists. It's telling us that the dark matter is made of particles. They're not baryons. Right? Moreover, the expansion rate of the universe determines the helium abundance. And this curve will become another curve parallel to it, above it, if I increase the number of neutrinos. If I add a singlet neutrino or uh, you know, new, two new massless particles or whatever, then this thing can go up. And then I no longer have agreement between the helium abundance, uh, may not have agreement between the helium abundance and the deuterium abundance. So I get a constraint on the expansion rate at one second. Actually, that constraint on the expansion rate at one second is more precise than the constraint we have on the expansion rate today. Interesting. Lithium is out of line with the others, and I have said that it is possibly indicative of non-standard physics, because actually, if I showed you that lithium is inferred uh, very, very uh, uncertainly from the uh, population two stars, then I don't think that it, we can really make the case for a problem. So I think I have just about enough time to uh, finish up on a few remarks. One is how we measure the baryon to photon ratio from the microwave background. So this is a whole lecture in itself, and I cannot uh, go into that uh, in detail. But basically, what we see on the last scattering surface of the cosmic microwave background is a snapshot of oscillations in the coupled baryon photon fluid at the moment when the universe turns transparent. And in the next lecture, you'll see that, that this happens very, very quickly. The ionization fraction drops very sharply. So you get a very clean picture. If it went on for a long period, then the th thing would be blurred out. And it is not, luckily for us. So that last scattering surface has a, a causal horizon of the order of one degree, which corresponds to a multipole of about 200. So most of the action is happening at this kind of multipole when you expand the temperature pattern into spherical harmonics. And for our purposes here, forget all that. The only thing that matters is that if I add more baryons, they load those oscillations. So that has the effect of increasing, as you see, as I increase the baryon density, the height of this first peak goes up, and the height of the, this guy here goes down. Okay? So the ratio of these two gives me a measure of the baryon density, which is reasonably certain. It depends a little bit on the slope of the primordial power spectrum, but not very much. Okay? So it then gives me a measurement of the baryon density, which, subject to some small caveats, is actually more precise than the one from the baryon density from, uh, from nucleosynthesis.
Of course, this is indirect. We are not directly measuring the baryon density. You are inferring it in terms of a model. So the fact that it agrees with the nucleosynthesis picture, which is based on hardcore basic physics, that's very reassuring. So when you do these measurements, you get, so this is from the last final number from WMAP. Planck gives a similar number. It's not very important. But this number is the one that you saw quoted in the last slide as the tiny little band, OK? And so to end, what we have then done in this lecture is to reconstruct our thermal history, starting from what we see around us, which we now see from the inverse of the Hubble expansion rate today is about of order 15 billion years, <coughs> because the universe is expanding at about 70 kilometers a second per megaparsec today. Inverse of that is that number. We have traced our expansion back by observing that the temperature is just related to the inverse of the scale factor. So A times T is roughly constant, apart from little glitches that don't show on this when the electrons and positrons annihilate and so on. And what we have seen is that if you go back in time to about a few minutes after the Big Bang, that is the earliest epoch that you have considered, that's when the nuclei were made. And uh, we therefore have reliable knowledge of the universe using this uh, Adiabat that you have constructed. Back to about here, we have relics. Beyond this point, we don't have any relics. We don't have any relic from the quark hadron phase transition or the electric phase transition, unfortunately. There has been a lot of talk of you know, possibly seeing quark nuggets or gravitational waves. or you know, There's always hope we might see something. But to date, we have no knowledge. We have no relics of the early universe from these phase transitions. We only have relics from the early universe in the form of dark matter, in the form of the baryon asymmetry, and in the form of the density fluctuations that grew under gravity in the dark matter to give us large scale structure. When they were generated, we don't know. We have no idea about what time they were generated, but certainly it was before nucleosynthesis, because to do nucleosynthesis, you needed the baryon asymmetry already. right? The expansion rate of the universe is precisely determined in nucleosynthesis. It is consistent with the radiation-dominated universe. Directly doesn't tell you about dark matter or about fluctuations. But we know that in order to create fluctuations on scales outside the horizon, you would have to have gone to some very early time when that could have been done. It, it can only happen at the transition between radiation and matter domination or during a deceder phase of expansion. These are the only two times when you can create fluctuations outside the horizon. So it's some early time. We don't know when that is. And we also don't know when the dark matter was created. But as you'll see in the next lecture, it was not too early. Dark matter, uh, typically of around the weak scale or lighter, was typically created around the weak uh, electric scale or below. Because the freeze out temperature of a massive particle is about the 20th of its mass if it's weakly interacting. So if it is a TeV mass particle, then it happens somewhere here. So basically, this is the epoch where dark matter decoupling occurred. We are reasonably certain of the thermal history then. Not entirely certain. Okay, You could invent all kinds of things that happened then, and I can't actually rule it out. If I want to actually rule anything out, you have to do your stuff after a second after the Big Bang. One second after the Big Bang, we are sensitive to anything that goes on. And in a machine like the large detectors at the LHC, you're sensitive to anything that happens within a microsecond. After a microsecond, any, the detectors are only about 10 meters big, so they would have escaped from the detector. So between one microsecond and one second, we really have no constraint at all on, on unstable particles. But the furthest that we can actually see directly is back to one second after the Big Bang. And as I said, all this stuff was created much earlier. So I think that is my last slide. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Questions? Um, why do you neglect uh, the chemical potential in the early universe? Why do we need a chemical potential? No, why do we neglect? Light. No, no. Um, how do we say? Neglect, right? Why do you neglect the chemical potential yeah. in the early universe? Because yeah. it's very, very small. It's like 10 to the minus 10. But how do you know? What do you mean, how do you know? Because we, what, if there was any chemical potential, by definition, it is a conserved quantum number. So it's conserved till today, right? Okay. So what we okay. see today is what was the excess in the early universe. So the same baryons that you and I are made of, that's 10 to the minus 10, 
in the early universe, there were many, many, many more baryon, antibaryon pairs. They don't contribute anything more, right? Okay. But also, the density was very low. So you may have seen, those of you who are doing heavy ion physics, they usually plot the chemical potential versus the temperature, right? The difference between what you do in a star or in an accelerator, etc., you're looking at a very different regime. You're looking at a high chemical potential of order one, right? In the early universe, you're looking at a chemical potential of order 10 to the minus 10. Right? But conversely, in the early universe, we have a temperature, okay? At machines today, we don't really have a temperature. That's a little misleading statement we do for publicity when you say we recreate the conditions of the Big Bang. We don't really do that because you don't really create a thermal environment. Except in, uh, if you cold gold on gold or something, if you collide, then maybe you can get a thermal environment. You certainly don't get it if you collide protons on protons. Right? But it sounds good, right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. One is, uh, how can you know that everything was in thermal equilibrium? I mean, somehow you, you look at very, very short time scales, so I would imagine it doesn't have enough time to thermalize. That's precisely the calculation we do. We look at the time scale, which is the scattering, inverse of the scattering rate, right? And we compare that with the expansion time scale, which is the inverse of the Hubble rate. So correspondingly, if I work out that my scattering rate is greater than the Hubble rate, that means the inverse of the scattering rate is shorter than the inverse of the Hubble rate. That's exactly what we do, right? So it doesn't matter how short the time scale is, it's a matter of the relative comparison of those two numbers. And as I showed you, you do get this surprising kind of uh, effect, such as that uh, the scattering rate will, in fact, not be able to keep up with the Hubble rate if I go to sufficiently high temperatures, which is, uh, where was it? Right. So for example, what you are saying is true. If I go to a temperature above 10 to the 14 GeV, the Hubble rate is so large, right? It's going as T squared over the Planck scale, right? How, uh, how, how is it in time? Do you know this uh, 10, to the 14? 10 to the We work it out. I told you it is one second at one MeV. So 10 to the 14 GeV is 10 to the 17 times one MeV. 10 to the 17 square is 10 to the minus 34. So it's about 10 to the minus 34 seconds. Uh, and the second question, just very short. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that many um, that the electrons annihilate into photons uh, very effectively. So that's not a nuclear process. So why is it so so much not time invariant? What do you mean time invariant? I mean, why uh, does it have such a strong error of time that uh, you have an abundance of electrons and then you only have photons? Well, electrons and positrons have electromagnetic interactions, so the cross section for their annihilation is of order a Thomson cross section. It's a very large cross-section. It's just the strength of the interaction that determines how strongly they annihilate. Try putting some electrons and positrons together. They'll be gone before you, you know it. They annihilate very, very strongly because, well, to be precise, they annihilate electromagnetically. I'm using the word strong here in the natural language sense. So they, they will wipe each other out. There'll be nothing left. Right? Okay, thank you. Or to be more precise, the time scale for their annihilation is shorter than the time scale for the expansion of the universe. That is always the actual clock. Everything we should say in comparison to the expansion time rate. Okay. Same question. Okay. Yeah, maybe another question related to this uh, slide. So you say the, the, the maximum temperature cannot exceed this 10 to the 14 yes. GeV, but I'm still a bit confused because on the next slide, if you see these, these nice plots, then I think there they extrapolate too much uh, higher. They, they shouldn't extrapolate higher. They, sorry? I, I, didn't, I didn't make that plot. They should not extrapolate higher. But so you say basically everything above 10 to the 14. Above 10 to the 14, there is no thermal equilibrium. So you can, should, we should take that part of the plot with a grain of salt then in that sense. Yeah, but you know, people want to show the quantum gravity epoch, etc., etc. I'm saying there's no thermal equilibrium at that scale. Okay. Actually, there is no thermal equilibrium for other reasons also. That you have to have enough particles within a horizon to actually have equilibrium. You'll find that as you approach the Planck scale, there is less than one particle within a causal horizon. So if the particle has nothing to scatter with, then what is the equilibrium? So you see, we don't, we, you should think about these things. When people formulate the horizon problem, they integrate the distance light as spread from t equals zero. t equals zero is the quantum gravity scale. 
We don't even know if there's a metric then. So these are all very loose ways of formulating problems. They don't bear hard scrutiny. Just to be sure that I understood well, uh, since you can talk about temperatures above those good scales, uh, we can't talk about temperatures above the good scale. That's what I'm saying. Okay, but in the di diagrams they keep there still. Uh, yes, yes. So, uh, well, okay. So as I just said to this guy here, those diagrams are constructed; uh, they're not quite accurate. So you know. Uh, even if I can imagine any other theory with more particles, fundamental particles, and different kind of interactions, no, maybe you have, I, I, you, have I to, could. you have to change your coupling. So the only thing that is going in there is the strength of the coupling. You know that the coupling is asymptotically free. The sure. highest coupling you can contemplate at high temperatures is some number like that. Okay, I mean, I won't argue with you if you tell me it's okay. 1 by 20 and not 1 by 24, but it's some number like that. Okay. okay. You're not going to change that. Remember, oh, I forgot to mention this very important thing. I can do this whole business only because the theory is non-abelian, okay? It's only because of asymptotic freedom that I can actually talk about a weak dilute gas at high temperatures, right? In the old days, in 1960s, people thought that the pion mass was the highest value of the temperature, right? Because that was the Hagedorn scale, right? And above that, you, you had a strongly coupled system. You would not be able to have an ideal gas. And then we, you know, asymptotic freedom was discovered. The fact that QCD actually becomes a very simple force, okay, when, when you free everything unconfined, only because of that we can do cosmology. Without that, you would not be able to do cosmology. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up. I should mention that somewhere because this is not uh, uh, sufficiently emphasized. Okay, just one more thing. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's naive, but uh, you talk about conservation of entropy for the universe, but it's not a closed system. How can I imagine that? Well, if it is not closed, what else is there? Well, I don't know. <laughs> the universe, by definition, is everything that there is. So it's not a, it's not a matter of semantics. Even if it's infinite. Huh? If, even if it's infinite. It doesn't matter. I can always construct a box. So we have theorems like Birkhoff's theorem and so on, which means I can ignore the rest of it. If I just consider a box, I put some photons into it. If I expand it, the entropy of the photons in that box is what I'm looking at. Right? You are talking about whether that box can exchange entropy with some other bath. I'm saying there is no bath. Uh, my, my preoccupation is because we can see only part of the universe. You can talk about it, but not the whole universe, right? True, but in this, right in this room, you and I can't talk to the rest of the universe. We can only talk to what is bordering us, right? Okay. So I'm saying always focus on local physics. Local physics is all that we know about and all that matters in practice, right? I don't care what the universe is doing far away. I know that locally space-time is what it is. I can do measurements here. I know things are conserved here. So for example, uh, energy. To energy is not a well-defined concept in general relativity. In particular, it is not a well-defined concept in uh, the friedman robertson walker metric, right? Because in order to define energy, you should asymptotically have Minkowski space-time. friedman robertson walker metric never becomes Minkowski. So energy is not a well-defined concept, right? That does not mean, that is, this is true, right? And there is a paper by Witten, not, not young Witten, his father, Louis Witten, he wrote a nice paper about this. The point is that it doesn't matter whether energy is a well-defined concept in general relativity for practical purposes. Energy is bloody well conserved in this room, okay, in any experiment that I do. So the fact that I'm unable to define it properly because I don't have the right boundary conditions at infinity should not prevent us from believing in what we know is true. So it's an interesting issue, bears thinking about. Thank you. I think they're tired. Oh, there's one. It's lowering from the effective number of neutrino species. I know that there's this limit from from uh, nucleosynthesis, but yeah. there's also this limit from the amount of radiation in the CMB at recombination. That's right. Uh, so that's what I was uh, showing you, that uh, the, the 
if you had the number of neutrinos larger, that would delay the point at which the universe became matter dominated, right? And the microwave background is sensitive to the, the scale, the scale factor at the transition between radiation and matter, right? So it's something called the early integrated Sachs-Wolf effect, and that can is basically well. Uh, did I have a plot of the energy spectrum? I, I have not discussed that in this lecture, but I can tell you very quickly. Uh, where is that? Yeah, this plot here. So the early integrated Sachs-Wolf effect, which is not shown here, would basically affect the shape of the spectrum here and over here, okay, in this region, L of 20 to about 400. And in principle, that is sensitive to uh, the precise point at which radiation dominates over matter. So if I add extra neutrinos, then that would delay it. It is also degenerate with these other quantities. I can fake that effect by changing something else. Okay? The CMB is a convolution of many, many unknowns. There is the spectrum of the primordial fluctuations, the baryon density, the matter density, uh, the scale of the horizon at the point where matter domination occurs and so on. Right? So if I can fix those other quantities by some independent means, then I can read off the radiation content. And when they do that, these days they claim that they can determine that the radiation content of the universe is more than photons. They can determine the number of degrees of freedom. And it is something of order 3.5 something plus minus 1. Okay? So it's consistent with having three neutrinos and photons. right? Some people argued that there was evidence for extra there. But I think the systematic uncertainty is far too large for that to be the case. And in any case, Planck has now... Uh, the Planck analysis says that everything is consistent with the standard model. And that, that number is, is a stronger bound than the one coming from nuclear synthesis, right? No, it's not a stronger bound. For the number of neutrinos, I would, uh, I would trust the nuclear synthesis bound as more secure because it's a direct measurement of the expansion rate okay, at the point where uh, nuclear synthesis occurred at the very same time. The CMB effect is more indirect. right? But correspondingly, the measurement of baryon to photon ratio from the CMB is more accurate, as you saw, than nuclear synthesis. Yep. So neither of these two numbers have to be the same, you know, but as it happens, they turn out to be all consistent. Excuse me. Uh, the entropy is, low, uh, uh, is large at the early universe, but uh, at the later time tend to allow value? No, uh, the entropy is the same. We are considering a conserved system. So the entropy does not change. In the real, you might think that you have, you know, are you referring to the second law of thermodynamics or something? Right? Normally, entropy is supposed to increase, right? Your room gets more disordered. It never gets more ordered by itself, right? But in the real universe, the entropy is so large that any increase of the entropy due to structure formation, et cetera, et cetera, is completely negligible compared to the amount of entropy you already have. Okay, there are 10 to the 9 photons per baryon. That's a huge amount of entropy already. We can't, okay, in principle, if you put all those baryons into black holes, then the entropy could be even bigger. So actually, in some sense, the entropy is very large, and in another sense, it's very, very small. It depends on how you look at it. I mean that we, uh, we start with a disordered system and... No, no, who said you started with a disordered system? We have to have started with an extremely ordered system in order to give the universe that we see. Otherwise, it would not have expanded smoothly and uniformly. It would all have collapsed into black holes or something. I mean, that is the argument Roger Penrose makes. Right? You have to have the initial so-called wild curvature exactly zero in order for that to happen, he claims. So... Discussions of entropy in the early universe are a little, you have to make them very, very carefully by saying what is it with respect to that you're measuring it, right? So as I said, in, from one point of view, I can say that the universe is just a gas of photons, and for every billion photons, I see there is one particle of matter, right? And therefore, to very good approximation, it's just a photon gas. The entropy of a photon gas is conserved, okay? Those little particles of matter might form galaxies or do something or whatever, but they generate such a tiny amount of entropy, it makes no difference. It's one part in a billion. Okay? I can neglect it. 
I can look at it like that, but I could also look at it that in order for this system to be like this, in order for it to be a photon gas with those particles just moving away from each other in the Hubble flow, the initial conditions have to be extremely finely tuned to make sure that those particles didn't all conglomerate under gravity and make black holes which have the maximal entropy in the universe, right? That needs very special initial conditions. So we could discuss this for a long time, preferably over a beer. <laughs> but, uh, but it is not something that we are concerned about here. We are talking just about the ideal gas, the entropy is conserved, right? Because there are no things, uh, like the gentleman asked earlier, there is no other source to which you are coupled. We are just considering an isolated system, right? And therefore, there is no way the entropy can change. So, to repeat one more time, we are constant entropy, we are in quasi-equilibrium, nonetheless we are able to study non-equilibrium processes like chemical synthesis because we are using all kinds of physics tricks to simulate it as quasi-equilibrium. That's because we are physicists, we always like to take shortcuts, you know, when you can get a simple answer. If you want to spend your life doing the full non-equilibrium, complicated finite temperature, chemical potential problem, you can do that, but you'll get the same answer, so why bother? Okay, unless there are more questions, last chance. No, then we thank Suvir again.